I'm so tired of like paying 150 for a first date and then you just ghost me. I'm, and the next week I'm like hurting for cash. I'm like, I could have really used that 150. Like, why did I have to? Also, the trade off of like going on a date and as the man being like, oh, this sucks, I have to pay, or as the woman being like, oh, this sucks, I might get murdered, is like a pretty big yeah, imbalance. Yeah. How you guys doing? <laughs> <laughs> My name's Krishna. Thank you all for being here and talking through masculinity, what it means to be a man, etc. cetera. Um, obviously, we couldn't fit every man in the country into this room. Uh, we tried to get a diverse perspective, but of course, that caveat, we're not everyone. I wanted to start by telling you why this is something that I'm interested in. I have an eight-year-old son, and I'm seeing him absorb what manliness might mean. I, like, I'm thinking to myself, like, what does it mean to be a man? To start, maybe we could just introduce each other to each other, and if you were to describe what it means to be a man or to be masculine. Uh, my name is Tahoe. I'm a black man from the hood. When I was young, being a man, you had to be tough. You had to be hard. And now, to me, being a man is a lot different. Now, to me, being a man is knowing when to be soft knowing that you don't always have to run the charge. You can actually listen, you know what I mean? So things have changed a lot over the course of the years for me. I'm Griffin, and I don't identify as a man. Um, I'm non-binary. I still have elements of you know, my identity that are masculine elements, that are feminine elements that don't fall within that range. And I, I personally just don't feel tied to like the, the norms or the confines of gender at all. Well, welcome. Uh, my name is Dylan, and I think that the notion of masculinity is just some, is something that can be possessed by man or woman. Man, woman, non-gender conforming person. What it means to be masculine is just like, you know, changing and like very fluid. Um, but I think that, you know, masculinity is something that just, you know, like you embody based off of just like how you show up in this world as a man and just, and just like, you know, how you go about being your day to day. How you show up. Interesting. Yes. What's up, guys? My name is Paul. I'm a fitness entrepreneur. Uh, I'm an immigrant. I came here when I was four years old with my family. It's kind of funny how we're talking about it. My take on masculinity is, is not about talking as much as doing. I think at its, at its core, a man has to be efficient, competent, and be willing to do what it takes for, for themselves and their, and their loved ones. I was not always a good man. I was not always what you would call a healthy masculine man. And so as my life has changed, I've identified five points that I think make a truly masculine man masculine. Okay. I think point number one is a man who walks with God. Point number two is a man who stands on principle. Point number three, which is a masculine man, is self-sacrificing. So someone who is willing to sacrifice for point four, the people that he leads, a true man is a leader. And number five, a masculine man is never a coward. That's a lot there. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I, that, let's get into that as we go yeah. on. I think what it means to be a man is responsibility. As a man, it, it can come with a lot of power, and with great power comes great responsibility. In short words, <laughs> that's it. That's from Spider Man, I think. Yeah, right? no, that's what's <laughs> Uncle <saying>. Ben. <laughs> um, James. Well, uh, my name is James Killen, uh, former United States Marine, turned Air Force officer. Uh, got a couple combat tours, um, but I'm also a father of three girls, um, who mellowed me out. The idea of, of masculinity is something that I find interesting because it is changing, uh, and I can actually see those changes in myself. Uh, and I think that's one of the reasons why, uh, why I wanted to do this panel. Thanks for your service. Andre. Hey, what's up? Uh, <laughs> yeah, men, 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 men. Uh, I think uh, my idea of a real man is, uh, you know, someone that gets the job done, you know, and... Um, provides and all that. I don't even know what that means anymore, but um, yeah, I don't know, it's changing every day. How do you think it's changing? No, it just seems like everything's changing every day. It's like a new world order, you know? So I don't, uh, I have a hard time keeping up with stuff. So I feel like tomorrow it's gonna be something else and people are gonna comment and be like, you're wrong, it's, it's this now. <laughs> but it's hard to talk about some of this stuff because you feel like you might say the wrong thing. I'm not really masculine myself. So I can't, I feel like I'm like the wrong person to ask. <laughs> you know, maybe, they're, maybe they're the right person to ask. Christian. What it means to be a man is to be a adult human male. That's sort of a very formal definition, but I think that might be a good place to kick off because there's a lot of talk, of writing, of research these days 
that says there's a crisis in masculinity. Is there a crisis in masculinity? And if so, like, what is that crisis? The thing that I see is, is a lot of deconstructing generational trauma. The be a man, boys don't cry, you know, this, that, and the other thing. Um, and I, I think that's actually one of the reasons why we see it as, um, a, as a crisis, because we're actually trying to redefine uh, what it what it means to be a man, and none of us have any idea um, because we're just out here trying to be whoever we are. That's right. I think that historically, being a man was rooted in patriarchy and misogyny, and now we realize how harmful that has been over the years, um, and so we don't really know how to define where we're supposed to be. And I think the reason, as they're saying, is a crisis is because the box has gotten so small for just being, say, straight, just being a hetero, right? Because if you do anything, women judge you. What do you mean anything? If I dance a certain way, or if I wear my hair a certain way, if I dress yeah. a certain way, they go, real men don't do that. Real men don't do that. And so you get scared to move a certain way because you don't want to get judged or outed out of the accepted part of your community. Um, and I think that that kind of has us in an uproar and we don't know where to be. Like, where's the safe place to be for men now? You know what I mean? And it's, it's kind of disturbing. You know, I was what you would call a toxic masculine male growing up. And uh, I had good men that sewed into me. You know, they gave me good advice, but I never found manhood and I never understood my place as a man until one day I humbled myself and I gave my life to the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm telling you right now, walking with God changed my life forever. Can That's you define, can you me. define toxic masculinity? Like what I would say toxic mean? masculinity is like what he was just saying, where you're using that, that, that leadership role or that aggressive nature in a harmful way to harm other people, to get your way. So the biblical structure for manhood is very humble. It's self-sacrifice, it's not self-motivated, but it is motivated by principle and standing on what's right. So there is a clear cut vision for manhood in the Bible that I live by and I think our culture used to live by and I think our culture has lost its way. I think everybody sort of has a different definition of toxic masculinity. I don't find masculinity toxic in and of itself, but I do believe in bad men and bad men exist. Um, but does that mean every man is toxically masculine? No. When you're talking about a crisis on masculinity, I think that there's a lack of understanding there. So it's like masculinity being masculine isn't toxic. It's just like there are portions of it that you can dive into that make it toxic. Because I think a lot of what we think of masculinity is tied into patriarchy, right? Which is right. to say, like, for the longest period of human history, like, men dominated women and got the lion's share of stuff. I think a lot of times some people make masculinity into a caricature. Like, it has to be this alpha bro tough guy. Exactly. And I find the low-key guy who, you know, is a really great father and a great husband and maybe not, like, drinking raw eggs every day <laughs> to be a lot more masculine than the alpha bro who's going and, like, banging 20 women per weekend and not a responsible man. I find it more masculine to be a good guy. I think the a background of this is that we are saying that gender is this like real thing that has real ideas and implications. And Griffin, I'm wondering, as you, someone who identifies as non-binary, how does this conversation strike you? Well, I think that it kind of becomes like irrelevant whether or not we attribute like having like a good ethical compass to being like masculine. Attributing that to like the gender constructs which we have made up, which are like somewhat pointless, like kind of just feed into needless roles that uphold the patriarchy without even knowing it. A lot of those things are just things that people should be doing because they're like morally right. Like if you're in a family, you should probably support your family. And I really don't think that it has to do with like your manhood. These characteristics that we're talking about are baked into an old system of domestic life. I think that's actually where we get toxic masculinity. Like none of us can really describe what it is, but we can see it when it happens. Uh -huh. So we it's, learn it, I'm right? Human. We, yeah. This is something we learn from the world. It's something we learn from like TV and shit. And it's maybe something we learn from our dads too. Tell me about your dad. I'm um, a first generation kid. My dad is from Guyana. Um, grew up in very humble beginnings, poor family. First time I remember my dad telling me he loved me was when I was 17. And he was like saying like he was proud of me because um, I was about to graduate high school and things like that, you know. I'm appreciative of all the other things, you know, being present as a provider, but in terms of like, you know, the conversation piece and like, oh, I'm, I want to talk to my dad about, you know, sex or something, or I want to talk to my dad about, oh, this, um, this person broke up with me and I'm feeling pretty sad about it. I didn't have those conversations. 
So like emotional language as part of like how you talk to your dad. Yeah. And my definition of manhood came solely from my relationship with God. It didn't come from my father. It didn't come from the good influences around me. Is God a man? Yeah, and God is a man. He and is. God, and, and God is a father, and he's mm. a good father. He's a perfect father. And so I think there is a clear definition of manhood where I guess that's where I diverge from everyone else in the room. I believe manhood is clearly defined by God. It is the perfect example of what a man should be. Christian, I see you nodding your head. I grew up in a divorced home. Um, when you do grow up in a broken home and you don't have a father in the home, you recognize how important sort of both males and females are in raising a child and being in the home. There's a balance between you know, masculine energy and feminine energy. Absolutely. And I feel like there's, um, there's both within everybody. And so there's a balance that um, with masculine energy in itself that I think a lot of people have trouble trying to, trying to like reconcile within themselves. Like, yes, being a man, you work hard, you take care of your people, but you gotta be able to have that emotional side too, which is where the feminine energy comes in. Y'all, y'all just like triggered something in my head when y'all was speaking about having both in the home. To me, I didn't really have it there. And it made me, it made me feel a way, but I think that I always wanted one. And so I wound up at a certain age going outside and trying to find what man masculinity was outside. Mm, and so man. I went on the corner and there were 20 of us on the corner and none of us had dads. We were all messed up. And so we all taught each other the wrong way to love, to be loved. And then I think in society, there's way more people like that. And a lot of kids who don't have fathers in the home, excuse me. Oh, no, no, you're um, good, man look for that father in the world or in a different way. In different yeah. way. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, first, I think that like uh, attributing like proper family values to like a heterosexual couple with children is like just not effective. Like I think that it's obviously like a heteronormative take to be like man and woman and then a child. And that's how you create like a good family, and whether it's like a single mother, single father or like a queer couple. Like I don't think that it's necessary to like attribute men and women to like certain roles in the household. I think that it's only due to nurture those gender norms that we follow. Male and female matters. God gives you one of those identities, you take on that role. And now you're responsible for not or for fulfilling that role. There's a masculine crisis because men are not taking responsibilities for the God-given roles that they have in society. And so when you take away the, the need to say God made you this or God made you this, now you don't have to take responsibility for not fulfilling what you were called to do. When you do that, you also take away other things that somebody else may do. If I have a woman or a partner that wants to take on certain roles and I say, hey, those are my roles that God gave me in society, now I'm suppressing that person. Like at the end of the day, we're all human beings. Yeah, I don't you define who you are and how you behave under God. That's what God gave us free uh, will. And but free also like, speech. I think that the religious beliefs should not be used to like dictate how other people identify or how other people live their lives. Humans need predictability. And when we put each other in these boxes, it gives us the opportunity to make decisions quickly. And I, I think that's what we're fighting uh, is as a civilization at the moment, is the desire to put seven and a half billion people in specific boxes so that we can have some sort of predictability or, or, or uh, stability in, in our lives. I was in emotionally abusive young man in, in my 20s because I had an idea of what my wife should do. And it caused a lot of, of stress. Why were you the way you were? You know, I had a lot of anger. Uh, I had a lot of uh, pent up rage. Uh, I had, you know, some combat stress that I had to deal with also uh, that I wasn't dealing with because men don't show emotion. There is a social construct that benefits men. And so the responsibility that I've learned as I've gotten older is learning how to not enforce my power, learning over women, over people. You, so, you're saying that that role gives men more- Privilege. Like an advantage and privilege. I'm saying that it is more self-sacrificing. I do not have free time. I do not have hobbies. I do not wake up during the day and do what I wanna do ever. I'm thinking about my wife, my kids, my business. But that's your decision and that's not like, like a mandatory thing of your masculinity. Well, it, if you believe that God is true, I don't. and you believe that he is God, then you do have that responsibility. What privileges are you, like, do you are referring to? Like what privileges do, male, do men have? We've constructed this entire society to benefit us. Break it down, like what privileges exactly? 
like we talk about the wage gap, or if you look at Roe versus Wade, men controlling women's bodies. Even if there might be those privileges, there's also more men who commit suicide, more men incarcerated. I think when you talk about like incarceration rates and things like that, like like things that men are a victim of, I think that it's important to like recognize, like I don't think that men are oppressed solely on the grounds that they're men. I think that men like experience oppression based on like the intersections of their identities, right. which is, you know, why we see like different like lower class jobs being worked by men or like higher suicide rates or like incarceration rates going up. Because like men, like black men, brown men, indigenous men, queer men, trans men, et cetera, those people like face oppression, they experience oppression, but it's not solely due to their identity as a man. But I think, I think dating and sex is probably a very interesting place to think about this because it's changing field as far as like what people expect of each other. I date in New York City a lot. And dating wise, there's a lot that's like asked of a man. Like first dates are like nightmares. <laughs> I got a like, question, I got a question. Like, yeah. Dude, it's like, I'm like, what do you want? They got like a checkbox, like, are you gonna pick me up? Are you gonna hold, are you gonna walk on the outside of the sidewalk? Are you gonna open the door? Are you gonna pull out the seat? Are you gonna pay for the meal? Are you gonna be interesting during the dinner? Are you gonna be funny during the dinner. And then when you walk home, are you gonna drop me off? Are you gonna watch me walk inside? And then are you gonna text me after? And it's like, it's like trying to defuse a bomb. Like if you <laughs> think you like, you're like red wire, blue wire, and you're like one little thing and you're just done. And it's like, I'm, I'm to the point where I'm like, I'm so tired of like paying 150 for a first date. And then you just ghost me. I'm, and the next week I'm like hurting for cash. I'm like, I could have really used that 150. Like, why did I have to, <laughs> when you, you know what I'm saying? Like, the trade off of like going on a date and as the man being like, oh, this sucks, I have to pay. Or as the woman being like, oh, this sucks, I might get murdered. is like a pretty big, you know, yeah. imbalance. On a first date, should the man or whoever identifies as the man on the date pick up the check? Show of hands, who thinks yes? Yeah, should is a weird. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah should is a weird. Right about it. Okay, yeah, sorry, weird. sorry. How would you put it? I very much love gender roles. I like masculine men, and I want my masculine man to pick the check up. My friends seem to be the same. My girlfriends seem to want that as well. But I have a male friend who was naturally doing that, and with the dates he was going on with women, they were offended that he like took the check. So I think like, hey, if this woman doesn't want him to pay and she wants to show she can pay, go off. I think it's a matter of preference. Like, you know, if someone picked it up for you, like you develop a kind of rapport, respect with that person, like so be it. If the other person, you know, the woman you're with doesn't want that, then maybe it's not the match for that person. So I right. think it's dependent on the situation. I think that there's such a thing as financial abuse and men seem a lot of time because they spend that a woman has to be under them or owes them something. Um, I think that's me, when you get talks. Me yeah. personally, I love to take care of my partner. I love that feeling that I give them that they're taken care of when they're with me. And that's when it's with friends, anybody. If you're with me, I got you. Like, I guess what I'm hearing from you, Andre, is that there's like a lot of pressure to uh, inhabit the masculine side of the social expectation, and yet you might not get the benefit that you would have expected generations ago. And that puts you in a weird position. Yeah, well, we live in a city where there's eight million people, and uh, you know, a lot of these girls, especially if you're really attractive, guys are hitting on them all day. So they feel like celebrities. You got so many options. I don't blame you, I'd be the same way. It becomes it's like a- with somebody better. I think technology has a big part to do with that now. Like yeah, modern sure. times, like online dating, well, Instagram. Instagram. Especially Snapchat. as a girl, you're gonna have 30 DMs yeah. a day. Yeah, the DMs. You know what I'm saying? Swipe it open your picture. I think that's a, that's, a, that's a bigger reason why it can be tougher for some men. Not successful. I, I think what he's, he's saying not, is he's there's, saying a, there's a toxicity to femininity as well. There is, there is a toxic side to both genders. Well, I think, I think anybody can be narcissistic, but I think that it's like weird to randomly attribute that to like women in New York because they're being complimented all day. There's a term that's called absolute power corrupts absolutely. absolutely. So, it, but that is when we're talking about masculinity, that's what we've had. We've typically had that. We can do whatever we want, and we do it because we squeeze, we corrupt, we take. Historically, you take over things, places that you don't like, and you rape the women, and you take the gold, and you, and you know, you do what you want because you have that power. Now when we see women have that power, we're like, whoa, she's literally just getting a taste 
of the power that men have had for centuries. But on the flip side of this perspective of dating, of like the poor guy who goes on these dates and gets ghosted and, and it's, it's a struggle to date, on the other side of that is uh, men have more sex, men cheat more, they have more affairs. So if I'm a woman and I'm looking for a guy, um, I would be really selective. I would have a list of what I was looking for and the guy would have to meet those standards and they would be high. I think that over the last several years, the Me Too movement has given a lot of insight into what women are feeling in the workplace, what they're experiencing, how they're being abused and otherwise silenced, how institutions of power have kept them silent. And we've heard some really awful stories and some terrible shit. I, I want to hear from you guys what you think about where Me Too, the, what the Me Too movement did. Has it gone too far? What does it mean for you? I think it's good for women to expose men who are doing evil things in the workplace. I think it's been a good thing in exposing sexual abuse. There's also the opposite side of that coin where, where women are allowed privilege to do certain things that men are not. So in the workplace, I, I was working at a place where a woman was grabbing me inappropriately, doing things that were inappropriate. And when you bring that up to your coworkers, you know what they say? They laugh and they say, you should be excited, right? So if a man is sexually abused, the, the stigma totally changes. Well, I don't Same think me too necessarily like is what prevented people from believing you and your story. And like, your story is valid, like I'm not here to suppress that, but I do think that like, it's worth noting, women are far more likely to be victims of sexual assault. You just experienced a little bit of weakness that women feel most of the time. When we're talking about constructs, you know, you guys are saying we need to deconstruct masculinity. I'm saying there's, there are unequal biases with both genders. When it comes to it not necessarily being as va um, viewed as, as valid, it, that it happens to be the case because of other men, though. You know what I'm saying? Like, other men are the people that downplay that, and that's where we come back to the talk of, you know, patriarchy and things like that. It was put in place by men and is enforced by men. Oh, and I, I, went for, I went for a walk to get dinner last night, and I, I walked several blocks because I wanted to check out a, a, a few things, um, and it was dark. Uh, not a single time did the idea that I would be physically or sexually assaulted cross my mind. Not a single time. Now, I can imagine that that doesn't really work out for, for women. It comes down to biological differences. As a man, you're more likely to be able to have a, more of a chance to fend off someone attacking you. As a woman, not really. So that's why, you know, we have things like mace and tasers or having a gun. Is it something about um, it's hard to admit that you're a victim? Yeah, for sure, for sure. And to, and to complain about it. People look at you like, remember Terry Crews? He didn't get his right. nuts squeezed and shit? Right. right. It's like, you know? why, why didn't you do something? Why'd you let him? Look how the world ri ridiculed him. You know, oh, you got, you ain't do nothing. Like, oh, you a bitch, you know? So we, as men, especially super guy, guys that grew up in a super masculine house, we don't really like to admit weakness. Well, we and, and, there's, and it's in our language, right? Like, don't be a bitch, like, don't be a pussy. Right. Like, it, it's, it's very we real. We internalize that. Yeah. Th that's all examples of like toxic masculinity. Like, it's never to invalidate somebody's experience, but like, like it must be obvious that like these, are rule, rules and roles enforced by men and created by men. Well, and, and toxic masculinity and power kind of go hand in hand. I mean, we're talking about peanut butter and jelly. You know what it is? I think sometimes we gotta go to work and like if we're caught complaining about it, we're like admitting weakness, it's like you're not a man. How does that feel? It doesn't feel great, but that doesn't stop me from doing what I need to do. Um, if you talk about a little bit of pressure that goes with it, yeah, there's a little bit of pressure. If you can withstand it, you become a successful man. But what does that have to do with being a man? Like, surely like a woman can do all those things, so why even attribute it to your gender? That's a good point, but I think also, um, if you're talking in terms of biological differences, generally, men are more logical, right? More reasoning, more factual I disagree. Based. There is no scientific backing for that whatsoever. I just think it's a commonly used stereotype. I mean, I'm so not- So they, they, they maybe talking about, okay, you guys can say that. I think more about me, somewhere. like I'm more of like a logical, you sure. know, factual based guy. Like I have emotions, um, but you know, I don't let that deter me from what I need to do. Like my, my reasoning. Do you um, talk with people about your emotions a lot? I mean, I have people, I have friends. I have close guy friends I can talk to. You do? Yeah. There's an interesting uh, thing came out where like guys these days have fewer than three friends. Like it's hard for men to make friends with each other. I think that's a big problem now in, 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 because, in modern and, times. Because you, you hear about, you know, the suicide rates going up. I think that's a big reason for it. Men aren't allowed to talk about it 
with safe people. So if you talk about masculinity crisis, that's the crisis right there. I think that men find friends very easily in terms of like, oh, yo, you lift um, 240, I lift 242, let's like spot each other, like basketball or whatever. But I think that we we have superficial relationships in those friendships, you know, in which like it's very like surface level, like coming back to what you're talking about, we don't talk about feelings and, and things like that. That comes back to how, you know, you're brought up and how like boys are taught in certain ways, how we go about talking to each other and how we go about expressing ourselves. How much of this is, is men putting ourselves in a little box. I can tell you, uh, I wouldn't have shared my emotions with, with people when, when I was younger, um, but I have people in my life now who I feel completely comfortable sharing my insecurities, my vulnerabilities, you know, how I'm feeling. That ends up being one of the reasons why men end up with limited friends. Because, I mean, how many people can you actually feel like you can be open and, and honest with. But there's something your, holding there's something holding people back. Yeah, men and, back. and I think it's us. I think we're we're doing it because we're putting ourselves uh, in in this masculinity box, if you will. I think that vulnerability. Um, for men oftentimes a view to surrender and like that is a um, you know what I mean that's an example of weakness in which like someone can possibly take advantage of it or it used to be viewed as such you know where it's like alright cool like he cried oh that means he's soft so now I can challenge him and, and this is something that I really struggle with um, as a black man that grew up in the hood you couldn't be soft you, you couldn't come outside you know what I'm saying so you you had to take on this this persona in order to be a quote unquote man as I got older, I realized I, st I still had to do that with women. I had to be a certain way for them to look at me as a man. And if I didn't perform in that manner, they also called me a bitch. Yeah, they want a real like Right? Poster. So it's like, yeah. as progressive as I may want to be, is the world accepting of that on a, as a whole? Because even if the, even if the other men don't like it, but the women like it, I might be like, I don't care what the guys think as long as the women like it. But there are spaces where the women will be like, look at him, he wants a finger in his butt. Sorry. That's <laughs> no, let's talk about fingers <laughs> in like his butt. He, you know what I'm saying? Like he, that's not my type of guy. He's not my type of guy. And I can't be open with sex or accepting having gay friends, pardon, you know. That's sorry. what you like? But I can't, right. Right, you can't be open about certain things because then you become questionable and you're pushed out of the safe space. You know, sex is a difficult thing for, for men to talk about even with, with each other, especially really? if you do have some kind of kink. Because you're not allowed to be vulnerable, you're not allowed to be weak, you're not allowed to fail. And a lot of people that, when you say the suicide waste, you give up because you have nowhere to turn. I kind of disagree with you on the, on the fact about that pressure is causing, I think it's more the lack of support and guidance for a lot of guys. Like, they don't know where to turn. Like, they, like a lot of guys, you know, suicide, I think, is like when you lose hope, right? So they just don't have hope. Dude, what, what about what not to wanting to go get it? Because there's, there's places to be, there's people to go. You can go to church. I mean, you can go to therapy. As there's much places as you to say go. that, but I don't feel like, you know, when, when you say guys don't want to express weakness, I think taking that step is, a, is hard for a lot of men. Because then that expresses weakness. It's hard for a lot of guys. You know what's interesting that what I'm hearing is that as men, you also are victimized by the sexist expectations of masculinity. It also makes it, um, hard for men to uh, love themselves um, and, and love themselves enough to understand that they're in trouble, you know? And um, I, I know that's something that, that happened in my life. It was b before I did finally go <clears throat> to therapy and get the demons out that I needed to get out. Um, it, it took me meeting uh, a woman who actually made me want to love myself. You found a woman who gave you peace and, and changed you a lot. Well, great, if, if a man is dating a woman and she doesn't like that he's not masculine enough, it's kind of like, to me, I feel like too bad for him, he should go find someone else. That's part of the dating scene. Everyone has things that they like and things that they don't like. I feel like your preference is your preference, but at like some point I think it's like noteworthy and responsible to like understand where those preferences or, or like originate. Not necessarily. I think our life experiences uh, form what we really want in our dating life. And because I grew up in a broken home and I didn't have a man in the house, I want a man who gives me security and protection. I don't think me deconstructing masculine is gonna do that for me. I was missing that in my childhood and that's what I want in a man. 
I tend to diverge from like the Freudian daddy issues stuff when it comes to like what Congratulations. people Congratulations, like. I'm so happy for you. I want a man who gives me security. Thank you, I, I don't think, like I think Freud. If I'm with a woman and the bad dates I've had is when I'm like talking about my problems, mm. I'm complaining about something, I'm not gonna see that woman. If I'm projecting more strength, and I'm, I'm more charismatic, I'm positive, I'm, I'm probably gonna see that woman. So I, I think as much as like, Guys, you know, you want guys to be vulnerable. That doesn't work a lot of times. And I think it just comes down to that. That's what I'm saying. That's what it is. Like, that's what I'm saying. And it sounds like a lot of you are saying that's wrong. I'm yeah, not and it's wrong. like, I'm not it's like, wrong. I think it is what it is. I just think that society teaches you you have to be a certain way. And that's really. And that's, and that's my issue. Because right. if this is who you are, your character, right, it, it just blossoms into this person that loves to pay for dates, loves to open doors, and loves to walk in the house, then that's fine. But when society tells you that from a young boy, that that's the only way to be as a man, this is the only way to be. And, and you think about things like, uh, say, people on a download that don't, that don't want to come out till later because they're scared of societal pressures, right? You should be able to be whoever you want without society telling you, you have to be this way in order to fit in this box. Pressure is on like the body. Like pressure is to be buff, to like look good. There is a certain pressure, I guess you can call it, for guys to look a certain way, especially if they're trying to attract women. So I think it comes down to just men who look a certain way tend to look more competent they can protect. I was just gonna add on to what you were saying. If a guy looks fit, if a guy looks strong, okay, as a girl, she's probably thinking, if I'm on the street and somebody tries to do something to me, I know that he can handle it. I also think generally, like, guys who don't have the body that they're looking for are generally, they're not as healthy. Um, it's not just a look thing, it's just a health thing. Yeah, that's you know, cool. the body and mind are connected. Um, if someone is strong, they're probably gonna look strong and they're probably gonna feel strong. So I think um, when you say it's a pressure, I think it's, it can be construed as a healthy pressure. Hey, get strong, be strong, because you're going to be a healthier and more mentally fit individual. For That's example, right, I was a gymnast, and I think, you know, the training that I did not only trained my body, but it winded up training my mind and making me right. a stronger human, period. As the skinniest person here... Um, <laughs> Pretty skinny. <laughs> you skinny? All right, as the second skinniest <laughs> person here... <laughs> No, it's like, I don't know. It's like, yeah, you do. I've, I've had a bunch of girls, like, friends on me, and I'd be like, why? And they're like, you're just too skinny. And I'd, I'd be like, damn. I mean, they kept it so real, I can't. That's, yeah, but I'm kind like, of to say that, yeah. Is saying that there is a, a good and natural connection between, like, feeling good, healthy habits, looking good, and that there's a masculine ideal to that of some sort. Does anyone disagree with that here? I do. Body diversity exists across like multiple spectrums, and I think that it's unfair to like only attribute like mental fortitude and like mental strength to like physical strength. Not having like a perfectly in shape body doesn't necessarily mean you're unhealthy by any means. And I also don't think it necessarily means that you like lack mental fortitude. I don't think I'm saying that um, um, to look strong is the only way to be mentally strong. Um, I think as long as you feel like you have a competent physical body, I think that's going to benefit your mental health. How do you define competent? Yeah. I think in terms of what you're trying to do. So if, what do you, are you a student? Like, do you, what are your endeavors in life? Me? Yes. I'm a student athlete. Okay, what, kind of, what kind of sport? I'm a springboard diver. Okay, do you um, train to do springboard diving? Yeah. Okay, and do you feel good when you train and you do well on the springboard? Yeah. I think that's what I mean. That's what I'm talking about. If you feel competent at the endeavors you're trying to do, I think that's but I think what that there contributes to a lot. Lots of like non-athletic people who may not be in like like the same physical shape as like an athlete would be, right. who are competent in what they're trying to do because that like action has nothing to do with like their like. So that's physical. where I disagree with you. That's yeah. where I disagree with you. I think some people who don't realize the potential for their physical to blend into your mental is something that needs to be talked about. I think it's undervalued. It's not that you have to work out to have a competent mind. It's that working out does Helps. help with competency. We already know when you work out, endorphins are released, people feel better. There's so many times I wake up, I don't wanna go to the gym, it's gonna be the worst day ever. I'm in a bad mood, I go, my endorphins are released, I'm great, I'm woken up. Like, we, we have the science for that, so. It's, especially I, listen, I'm, I'm, it's not I like it plays very little. We've had presidents in wheelchairs. They were very confident, successful men who couldn't walk. And so I'm gonna say that it doesn't 
define you I as I think a there's man. always a... But is there societal man. pressure to be in shape for men? I don't... And then I, 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 I just... I don't like when my stomach, when I'm having sex, and my stomach like is over her butt or whatever. <laughs> like, uh, I want to eat got, less, got, me. Paul but nobody's can change like, that. Yo, you're fat. We've spent all this time like deconstructing masculinity and all these things, but then it seems as though if a woman or someone dating says, hey, I want a swole guy, suddenly it's like, sorry, I don't think that's a societal pressure. That's what that woman wants and she's entitled to have. But I'm, it's I'm context. Also, I also, you know, I have body type. Yeah, know, I agree with that. Like there's, I'm not gonna say what it is, but there's certain girls where I'll go on it and I'm like, you don't really have the, what I'm looking, I don't say that because that's the dick, but in my head, I'm just like, ah, this isn't gonna right, work. So it's I like one thing fair. to have a preference and another thing to make like a sweeping like conclusion and then like broadcast it everywhere. No, people right. are entitled to date their preference. Because when you look at statistics, they say that, what is it, like 70% of CEOs are over the size six foot four, for yeah. example. So there is amongst men a pressure to be bigger and bigger men tend to be in charge and that's proven statistically proven. And so there is a pressure for men who are naturally smaller, naturally overweight, naturally not as fit, to become fit or to become bigger. Oh, and every uh, one and of I us here have heard little man syndrome. We, oh yeah, we've all who heard hasn't it. heard every that one of us have heard He's got it. Napoleon syndrome, he's got right. little man syndrome. Yeah, that's a thing though. Yeah, yeah it, <laughs> <laughs> there's nothing you can do about it. And that's where um, that's where it becomes harmful. Specifically like, you know, you know, short king spring or whatever, like a person, I mean, you can't like, I mean, there is like, I guess like on Twitter, I've seen like, oh, people getting a surgical procedure to break their legs and add six inches uh, to their height or something yeah, like that. that. It's stuff you can do. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, you know, like, but yeah. like besides that, which is like a really expensive uh, procedure, it's also like comes into socioeconomic background and things like that as well too. And it's like, you literally, like, you literally can't do anything about that. I think that's where it becomes harmful, which like, all right, like if there is the pressure in which like I can't date a person or I can't like get a position or I can't do X, Y, and Z because I'm not a certain height or um, something I literally cannot change about myself, then what now? What is big dick energy? <laughs> it's, it's, it's when confidence crosses the line of arrogance. That's exactly I don't, I don't told me I, no. People have told me I, I have agree. BDE. You have BDE? I, yeah, people told me I had BDE. You did in that back room. Not to show off. <laughs> right? even, he, even he said, I, look at that. I think, I think BDE is like just a, a confident confidence. man. I don't think it's an arrogant man. I don't yeah. find arrogance to be Big dick energy, I find it to be insecure. If you're arrogant, you're trying to like, I don't. It's no I find it stage. so odd to equate somebody's like the size of their genitals to like the quality of their character. Like what, that's nobody's a lot business. Of it's more see, of just like a metaphor. I don't know. Yeah, for yeah, confidence. A, yeah, see, but, that, really see, like but like then a, it comes back, now we're getting into like, you know, a deeper conversation, which like some men see a value based off the size of what they're what they carrying between their legs, you know what I mean? Yeah. So like, that's why the conversation of big dick energy comes into, into place because people feel as though like, you know, a man that's like, you know, more, that's packing more down there, you know what I mean? Is more like, you know, one, they're better in bed, they're like more confident people, they're exuding a certain energy. So that like, the, yeah, the stereotypes. You but know, so the stereotypes associated with having a big dick. The lack of a need to awesome. overcompensate to society because you know you're adequate. You know what you got. You, you walk confident. with confidence because right. you, like, uh, you can tell when somebody's putting on because they lack in certain, in certain ways. And men, me, and people I know, equate manhood and masculinity to their dick size and how much money they got. Mm -hmm. Like, it's like, yo, you feel more confident. And sometimes that kind of stuff bleeds into violence. And you see that in domestic violence situations, like men are like the perpetrators of that by and large. There's something wrong with masculinity when it becomes violent. 100%. I also think because of testosterone and a number of different things, men are inherently more violent. Hmm. But being able to control it, that's the, yeah, that's the important. It's being able to control it. That's where yeah. the responsibility comes in. Yeah. I think, you, you know, you hear the whole saying, like, um, it's, better, it's better to be a warrior in a garden than a gardener in a war. And I think there's a lot of wisdom behind that saying. Right. Oh, George Orwell said, uh, said, people sleep peaceably in their beds at night because rough men stand ready to do violence on their behalf. I think that's a, that's a big thing, but the, the key is to be, to be ready, to have the ability um, and, exactly. and also the humility and the confidence um, to not use it unless it's absolutely necessary. I don't think we teach boys that enough because I think promoting violence is extremely toxic. Is there something inherently violent about masculinity? Inherently violent? I don't think, I don't think so. No. I don't no. think so. If a majority of men were bad, evil, violent, 
a lot of us would not be sitting here today. <laughs> okay, we'd still be in the in the in the in the Stone Age. You know what I mean? That's why I I, I kind of push back against that that idea that inherently men are violent, inherently masculinity is bad, is violent, because I don't I don't believe that that's true. Why do you think that such a vast majority of mass shootings are done by men? I think that's a mental health issue. I think that and it, and this is why we're talking about men in crisis. Yeah, because men are more willing to to do what they have to, you know, to not do what they have to do, but to take action in terms of that. And that's how we talk about this, you know, men in crisis. A lot of those mass shooters are males because a lot of males, they don't know how to have an outlet or to find outlets to, to talk about what, what their issues are. That's what it comes down to. We know that these mass shooters, most of them are white males. We know that. So when I talk to, to a lot of white males, that, are, that have traditional values, say, or maybe a traditional upbringing, they feel like they've been made to be the villains of society. And so I feel that pressure a lot of times. I feel like, hey, like when we're having this conversation, even I hear words like patriarchy, traditional uh, society, right? So I feel like I'm being put in a box and, and, and made to be the villain. And I hear this from a lot of white males. I feel like I'm the bad guy. I feel like I'm the villain. So maybe at some point, mentally, they're breaking and becoming that villain. They're becoming that monster that at they've been made out old, to be. Be the exception. Yeah. If you're worried about being put into a box that is one that is like clearly harmful based on like what people are doing, then don't do that. Mass shooters is like obviously like a sensitive topic, but a lot of them are like men with like little to no friends who like go out and in like a burst of rage commit like atrocities. And it, I don't think that it has to do with how they're hardwired as men. I think that it has you to could, do with how society like treats people like that. I agree with you on the point that men need support and they need someone to, to talk to and, and talk about these issues. I don't think that men have been taught emotional intelligence throughout life, right? We know, so we respond with anger. All right, if I'm disappointed, if I feel resentment or I feel contempt or I feel embarrassment or I feel jealous or any of these things that fall under that one thing, we respond with one way. And if we learn how to communicate better, if we were able to say, yo, you know what? I resent that you spoke to me that way. Or, you know, I feel jealous, you know, of whatever. If, if it was okay for men to express those things, we wouldn't feel the need to just go, you know what? Fuck you. You can take two, any two three-year-olds. You take a three-year-old boy and a three-year-old girl. I have two girls. You know, their, their first instinct is to lie to me, to manipulate me, to, to say their sister said this when she didn't. I have a friend that has all boys. You know what they do? They throw a fire truck at your head. Bam. That's a natural response. That's not a learned behavior. They're, well, they're taught. Oh, that's totally a learned oh, behavior. Yeah. And you yeah, give that's, kids that's only like behavior. cars and gun yeah. and G.I. Joe action figures and give girls Barbie dolls. Like you, you. I don't think you could say it's one or the other. I think there is some interplay between both. To thank you guys for your honesty, your like willingness to go to uncomfortable places, willingness to debate one another. Yeah, I'm, I'm interested to see like what sticks with me like in days to come after after our conversation because I think so many things were raised in such sort of a diverse perspective group. Thanks for having us. Oh, thank you. So nice to meet you. Yeah, it's nice, nice to meet nice several of them. Oh, thank oh you. I should have discussed the importance of handshakes. Yeah, yeah, just, sure. to be, just to be, just <laughs> you know, like you guys said, uh, masculinity is something that I think that is misunderstood. You know, I had some people agree with me and disagree with me. The entire thing is uncomfortable. And my favorite part. Oh, oh, that's hard. Um, agreeing to disagree with certain other people, and <laughs> I liked when things turned into like this weird conversation about daddy issues. Y'all got my number, when you gonna do another one? What was I thinking when the conversation went to buttholes? How do I answer that? <laughs>